He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Brother Lockridge just had a little bit of a way with words, didn't he? Turn with me to the book of, to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 8. We're going to begin in verse 27 today. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. What a great question. Do you know him? Do you understand who he is? Are you experiencing him? Is he Lord of your life? Tell you what, Jesus asked that same question in a little bit different way. Jesus asked the question about his identity, and he asked that question about, do you know who I am? Let's go ahead and read from the Word of God today. Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Would you stand with me, please? Mark chapter 8, verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And he told them, and they told him, John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. Others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, and this is the question, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Thank you. you. May be seated. Oh my goodness. Who is he? Who is this one that we have come to worship today? Who is the one whose name comes so easily from our lips? Who is Jesus? 
Well, today we're going to go ahead and just let our passage speak to us real quickly these next few moments. Allow us to understand Jesus' conversation he had with his disciples. They were going up north, going to a place. Now, some of the other Gospels will give more detail. Matthew certainly gives us a lot more of the conversation that took place. But Mark includes enough to make his point. Mark includes enough to let us know what the real conversation, what the heart of that conversation was. Who is Jesus? Who do you say that I am? Who do others say that I am? And then we're going to look a little bit later at another, just the very next passage. We're going to find out who Jesus says he is. Others, others proclaimed him as somebody else. Someone else. You know what, there's a great lie that has been foisted upon our culture. We have been told that we are the determiners of our own theology. It's up to us to decide who we are and the kind of worldview we want to have, the kind of world that we live in, the kind of things that we consider right, wrong, appropriate for us, the things that are going to define us be about who we are. And so when it comes to answering this question, who is he, he is the one we want him to be. He's the one that fits our worldview, that fits our experience. He's the one who we're going to be able to understand. He's the one who is made, Lord, help us. He's the one who is made in our image. Who do others proclaim him to be? Well, it's a great question. And you know what? Regardless of what the world says, who's Jesus? You make it up, whatever you want. There is no wrong answer, they tell us. But here's the truth. For every question, there is a wrong answer. For every question, there is an untruth in a reply that might be made. You know what? Some will tell us that he's a great preacher, a great teacher. Some will tell us that he was a good man that just fell uh, on the wrong side of the religious authorities. Some will tell us that he had some good things to say. Muslims themselves say that he was one of the prophets, that he spoke some words of God. The problem is, while that answers the question, it's the wrong answer to the question. And my friend, today, when we talk about who is Jesus, what kind of Jesus is he, what role will he play, and what place does he have within our lives, we ourselves might join the people and say that he is something that he is not, and we will be wrong. Others proclaim him as someone else. But you know what? Our story continues with the fact that Peter proclaimed him, proclaimed him to be the Messiah. Peter had an answer. Now, it's a common theme in stories today, a trope, if you would, an idea, a kind of an underlying vehicle that allows the story to be told. It's about the fact that something is broken. And it's been broken for a while, and there have been prophecies about a chosen one that would come. A chosen one that would take what is broken and make it right. Many times the story is about this chosen one himself, battling and dealing with who he truly is, and understanding his role and his identity, until finally he comes into the real person that he is, and he brings peace where there was discord. The Greeks called him Perseus. A typical chosen one story of their mythology. Our forebears of ancient England called him King Arthur, the one who would pull the sword from the stone and bring peace to the land of Great Britain. And even in our own modern literature, it is ripe with the story of Anakin Skywalker, the one who would bring peace to the chaos. You see, They're all stories, but they're all stories that are based on the truth that the ancient Israelites held. It's a story that's found in Genesis chapter 3. 
It's the story of the Bible. It's the story of Jesus himself. It's the story about the brokenness of man, the fall of man, the sin of man, the man now separated from God. And even as God pronounced judgment on that day, he offered a word of hope. A word that said that there would be one who would come whose heel would be bruised by the serpent, but he would bruise the serpent's head. Those few words, those few ideas, that that chosen one, for the very first time God said it's broken, but there is hope for there is a Messiah coming. A chosen one, an anointed one, a Christ. The idea that what is wrong will be made right. Now, it doesn't have all the other stuff that the world has added into those stories down through the time. It's a very simple story of man waiting several millennia until finally Jesus comes on the scene. The Messiah who is prophesied of old. The Messiah that was taught to the children. The Messiah that Jews even today still yearn for and still look for. They gather at the wall of the temple and they wail at Asking for God to send a Messiah who's already come. Jesus, Messiah. And Peter himself, after hearing all the other answers, all the other things, now this is the moment that Mark has been waiting for. Leading up to this point, he really has been hard on the disciples. He really has almost ridiculed their lack of faith, their lack of understanding. They had Jesus among them doing all these wonderful things, feeding the 5,000, healing, even raising the dead. Jesus had done so much, and they still didn't get it. They still didn't understand it. They still didn't get who he truly was. And finally, Jesus decides, let's have a conversation. Let's figure it out. Who do you? say that I am. Come on, you 12. You've been with me all this time. We've been in the boat together. We've been on the hillside together. Tell me who I am. And Peter, in one of his amazing, impetuous outbursts, said, you are the Christ. I can't help but think that Mark wept as he finally was able to put those words on paper. Words that he hinted back to in chapter 1, verse 1. The Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one that's going to take what is broken and is going to make it right. Peter finally got it right. And Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Peter finally gets hold of it. And Jesus says, shh, keep it to yourselves right now. Why would Jesus say that kind of thing? Because even then, they were confused about who Messiah really was. You see, for them, they saw the white horse Jesus They saw the one who is the warrior coming in regal glory, coming to smite the enemies of God's children, put everything to right and make it all the way God designed it to be. They thought of Messiah and they thought of the ultimate victor. That would be the Messiah they would go testify about. That is the Messiah that they would go teach people about. That is the reputation they would lay upon Jesus. And while Jesus certainly is all of that, he also understood that there was somewhere he needed to go before he got on that white horse. There was something that needed to happen. A far greater battle than the battle of Armageddon. A far greater war than the war that would fill the valley with blood. But rather it would be a battle that shed his own blood in price of the sin of all mankind. That is the Jesus Messiah. The suffering servant that he himself proclaimed. Go ahead and look with me in verse 31. And listen to what he says as he talks about that. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. 
Imagine how that sounded to them. You are the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. You're the deliverer. You're the one who's going to bring it back. You're going to be the victor. You are the warrior king. And Jesus says, wait a minute. You need to see all of me. And all of me is suffering. All of me includes pain. All of me includes sacrifice and includes death. They might go out professing this Jesus as Messiah. But they wouldn't be preaching the full gospel if they did. Shh. Be quiet. You got some more learning to do. But you got enough for right now. You made it this far. You're going to understand more in just a little bit. But right now, you've got it. But shh, don't go preaching your ignorance yet. <laughs> Jesus said, you got to know who I am. But Peter, still impetuous. Peter, still who he is. Well, just this moment, he finally got it right. You are the Christ. Now he decides, well, he knows what's what. He knows what's going on. And Mark says that he rebuked Jesus. Same word Jesus would use to rebuke demons out of those who are possessed. Peter used that word on this Christ himself, saying, no, 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 you got it wrong, Jesus. That's not the Messiah. That's not the Deliverer. That's not the one we want. That's not who we understand. And Jesus rebukes him back. Jesus calls him out for who he is. It says there in, in verse 38, and he said this plain, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And turning and seeing his disciples, he, Jesus, rebuked Peter and said, listen, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, the enemy of God. Get behind me, the one who would deter me from my path. Get behind me, that one who seeks to be in charge and in control. Get behind me, Satan. He said, your mind, Peter, is on the things of man and not on the things of God. The drama of that amazing moment, of that amazing time, Jesus says, I'm the one in charge. I'm the one with the timetable. I'm the one that knows what happens next. Don't you dare try and turn me into something that is convenient for you and your way of thinking and your way of understanding. Don't you dare turn me into something that you want. You get behind me. I'm going to be who I am. Follow me. Get behind me, Satan. He lets him know that he is king and nobody has say so in his life. And it's just not, and listen, we need to get right theology here, folks. It's not that one day Jesus would be king. It's not that after he went to the cross and rose from the grave and ascends to heaven and now he comes back, then he gets to be king. No, 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 no. Jesus is king before the creation of the world. Jesus is king. He comes, a little baby in a manger. He is king. He teaches the people on the hillside. He is king. He goes ahead and goes up against the Pharisees. He goes ahead and heals the blind man. He goes ahead and makes the deaf be able to listen. He raises a little girl from the dead. He is king. And even when he goes to that time of torture, that time of torment, that time of agony, that time of suffering, that time of shame, he is king. And one day, three days later, that king walks out of the grave alive. And one day, yes, the king is coming back, riding on the white horse, taking out the enemies of God and of his people, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Make no doubt about it, Jesus is king. Do you know him? <laughs> Friends, that's what Jesus was saying. Get behind me, Satan. I got work to do. And I don't need to mess around with your distraction, with your impure thoughts, with your misguided advice. Get behind me. 
Jesus says he's king. And I know what you're thinking right now. Oh boy, he's closing his Bible. He's getting ready to land the plane. Hallelujah. Please, don't stop listening right now. Because I think the Lord has a word for you today. A word that lets us know it is all too easy for us to fall into the same snare that Peter has fallen into. All too easy for us to get a Jesus that we want. A Jesus that is comfortable for us. A Jesus that fits us. And if we're not careful, we'll miss King Jesus. Because you see, some of you have a Sunday Jesus. Some of us has a Jesus that shows up here at the church house. And we enjoy him. We like him. We listen to him. We sing to him. We enjoy the people that he calls his own. It's a good place for us. But when everything is all said and done, the most we got is a Sunday Jesus. And friends, listen to your pastor. You don't need a Sunday Jesus. You need an ICU Jesus who's with you on the worst day of your life. You need... A Jesus that is a payday Jesus. Amen. You need a Jesus that shows up when you ain't got nothing left and says, I will supply all your need. You need a watching TV Jesus. Uh Uh-oh, we're getting personal now. You need a Jesus that shows up, that's going to guard your eyes and guard your mind and guard your soul and guard your heart to the very things of God. You need a watching TV, Jesus. You might only have a Sunday go to meeting, Jesus. But he's not helping you out at other times. Gentlemen, We need a, got a disagreement with my wife, Jesus. Because we need to be reminded to love her and to honor her and to respect her. We need a Jesus that's going to show up and help us love her the way that Jesus loved the church. Parents, can I just be real honest with you? I've been there. You need a sitting at the ball game, Jesus. Somebody who's going to be there with you that helps you say the right thing. Am I hearing any amens right now? A Jesus who's going to be there and help you with a spirit of peace and a spirit of joy and a spirit of discipline. A Jesus who is there, who curbs your tongue and lets you show grace and mercy. The world is crying out to see Jesus and they don't need to see him just a Jesus at church. They need to see you in every area of your life. Students, please hear me. As someone who loves you so very, very much and wants nothing but the very, very best for you. You don't need a Falls Creek Jesus. You don't need a Super Summer Jesus, a Mission Trip Jesus, Senior Adults. You don't need a Revival Go to Meet in Jesus. Students, you need a Friday night out on a date Jesus. You need somebody who is with you 24-7 and keeping you on his path. Listen closely. Please, God has a plan for you. God has a design for you. God has an opportunity for you for blessing and for hope and fulfillment and happiness. A plan, a promise for you. 
and you need Jesus with you to stay on that path because of some other, other things, yes. I know what the media is telling you. I know what friends are telling you. I know what others in your life are telling you. But let the Word of God tell you that sex outside of marriage is wrong and is not on the path that God has for you. You need a quote Friday night, Jesus. Somebody say amen to Brother Dan. Friends, our problem today, my problem today, is that I got a Jesus for this situation and that situation in here. And my constant walk is to say, Jesus, you got all of me. Sometimes I feel like I got a waiting pool faith, you know? The kind of faith that just puts my toes in, walks around a little bit, says, oh, isn't this nice and isn't this good? But Jesus calls us to the deep end. He calls us to plunge in wholly and completely immersed in who He is. Folks, that's why the baptism is hold them under till they bubble. That's why it says buried with Christ. Everything completely. God, my life is yours. That's a King Jesus for your life. That's who the world needs. That's who need, they need to see. And dads, fathers, thank you so much for who you are. Can I give you just this one little word on this day of fathers we celebrate? Your kids need to see King Jesus in you. They need to walk in on you on your quiet time. You might need to plan it purposefully so they're going to see you when you're in God's Word. But they need to see who Jesus is. They need to hear who Jesus is. And they need to understand who Jesus is. And there is no one better equipped to tell them than you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are and what you're doing. Let us continue to tell this generation that Jesus is King. Do you know Him? Friend, today, We need a King Jesus. For the world is watching. And they're listening. They're looking to see who you are hanging with. Today, maybe it's a day just to say yes, Lord. Just to go ahead, hold the nose, close your eyes, and jump in and see how the Lord's going to take care of you. Some of you are dealing with an issue of salvation right now. You have never trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He is somebody you've heard about. He's somebody you've thought about. He's somebody that wants everything you have. Will you surrender Him today and find out the blessing that it is to follow Him? I'll be down here at the front. If you're at home, you can call that number that's on the screen and you can go ahead and talk to a deacon who's going to share with you how you could accept Christ as the Savior. Jesus, who do you say He is? And there are some here today who've been following Jesus for a very, very long time and your heart has been touched because you realize that maybe there are places he is not king. Listen to the truth of this statement. If Jesus is not king of everything, you have told him he is king of nothing. Today, Maybe it's just that recommitment, that rededication and saying, Jesus, all over everything I am. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how that's going to act. I'm not sure all the ramifications, but Lord, I want you and only you. Students have made decisions even this week of a commitment, rededication to him. There are folks who are looking at joining the fellowship of the church. This is that moment. I'd be glad to talk to you about what it means to be a part of Chisholm Heights Baptist Church as we continue to follow Jesus. There are some here today 
who you know that Jesus is calling you into full-time leadership, or into leadership within his congregation. He's calling you to serve him as a minister of the gospel. Full-time service, whatever you want to call it. It means that, Lord, even my career is yours. And, Lord, I understand you calling me to serve the church in a leadership fashion. I'd love to talk with you more about what that is. Chris would love a chance to talk with you more about what that is. Maybe today you're going to come and say, yeah, I want to see what that looks like in my life. Friend, today, this invitation time, yours. How you respond. Who do you say he is? Jesus, thank you this day. Lord, thank you for your great power. Thank you for your great love. Lord, we are unworthy. As a congregation, we come before you today saying, Lord, we don't deserve it. We are just ever so thankful we got it. Lord, we love you. So Lord, lead us in obedience. Lead us in your path. Lead us on your way. That Lord, today, we might lift you up as King, as Lord, as the one who is over all, even over our very lives. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I am so glad you're able to be part of our worship service today. And, you know, my prayer every week is that the Lord would speak. It's not about me. It's not about my opinions or my commentary. It is all about what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say to you, the thing that he has for your heart and the direction he has for your life. And I pray today that he has spoken to you. And maybe there's a time sometimes when that, that speaking implies a direction. Maybe you need to consider some decisions. Maybe there's something the Lord is saying, not just to think about, but something to take action on. And this is your time. The phone number is there on the screen. You can call the church office. One of our deacons is there ready to go ahead and take your call. Maybe it's a day to accept Jesus as your Savior. You've had some questions about that. But you know, when all is said and done, this is the day of salvation for you. Would you call us? Maybe there's a need in your life for, for a prayer. Maybe there's a question about church membership. Maybe there's something else that the, the Lord is dealing with in, in your life and you just want to be able to have another human being pray with you over the thing that is before you. Give us a call. Let us know. You can also email us if you'd like. But the bottom line is that this is your time. Not just a time just to watch a worship service, but I pray that today has been a day when you've been able to participate in the worship service and the Lord has been able to speak to you. May God bless you and again, thank you for being part of what the Lord is doing in our church today. Let's have a word of prayer. So Lord, thank you for your work. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that moves and Lord, for the fact that you have a will and a plan for our lives. Continue, Lord, to lead us and guide us this day. For it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.